the greatest. I really love it. It's that's, an honor to be here backing him. That's very lovely. You want to handle this introduction? Yeah. If you were to try to try and give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Berry. Right. In the 1950s, a whole generation worshipped his music, and when you see him perform today, past and present all come together. And the message is, hail, hail, rock and roll. Right on. You're live. All right, I'm live. You're live. We're all live. Technically, it's really Saturday night, but you don't don't get wild and crazy. Sit back, relax, because I have a good friend coming on. Slim Jim Phantom, Stray Cats. This record I want to talk about. I found this record, Rant and Rave, and Slim Jim Phantom will be here in the studio now. Boom. Chuck and Wax. Look who's Last knocking off. on my door. Look who's here. Last old... off. We're here. Slim Jim, welcome to Talking Wax, my old friend. You know, Jim, I go cruising for vinyl. I like vinyl. You like vinyl. Yeah, I look, the whole house is filled with it. It's yeah, what do, you, what, what do you have? What's Give me a couple of records that you have next to you right now for our vinyl friends that are watching. Right right off the top, we have the Straight Cats one that we're going to talk about, but the most important record ever. Gene Vincent rocks in the blue caps role. Ask anybody. Ask Jeff Beck. Ask Joe Perry. Ask anyone who. Ask Brian Setzer. Ask Dave Edmonds. Anyone who has recently told me this is the one. Um, there was one record store on Long Island that had the old stuff, and you can see it in the very top corner. Whirling disc. It's got a five one six area code. Oh, that's fabulous, Jim. And it was eight ninety nine back then, right? That was an expensive album. Yeah, yeah. They didn't have it at Sam Goody or you know, Licorice Pizza, or whatever they had back then. Um, but uh, eight ninety nine. You remember buying that record exactly? You remember the day oh, when you yeah. grabbed it? Tell me the yeah. story when you grabbed that when you're a kid. I think when we went there, we, we you know would take little pilgrimages up to that was in Farmingdale. So from Massapequa was just up the, up the southern state a little ways. And uh, there was one store, like I said, Whirl and Disc, that sold Rockabilly Records and Roots Records. It was just some regular guy. He wasn't a rock and, yeah. a rockabilly or a rock and roll guy. He just ran an old record store. He didn't even care. Like, hey, these three kids out of the blue with, uh, with pink suits and uh, high hair and black and white shoes are all of a sudden out of nowhere, the first time ever coming into my joint and getting my records. He didn't care. <laughs> he was just happy to uh, happy to sell it to us. Gene Vincent on in the back over there. They had all the Gene Vincent records. This this one I would have got later. Um, but we rock around the clock. Yeah, I remember you were just talking about that. That's right. That's right. There's 20 good ones on this. ABC Boogie, Razzle Dazzle, Two Hound Dogs, with Rock Around the Clock, Shake Rattle and Roll, Birth of the Boogie. Rock a beat and boogie. I mean, they're all on this one record. Let <laughs> me just give a little bit of information. He was eight. His, food, his, his family moved to a new home near Wilmington, Delaware. At 15, Bill went out on his own, worked in an open air park, yodeled with a band. You know, it's, so, <laughs> it's, it's like, don't, even don't. on these Gene Vincent ones, we love them. Um, Gene is five foot nine and weighs 150 pounds. He has dark curly hair and brown eyes. When it comes to eating, his first choice is usually a cheeseburger. Easy on the catsup. <laughs> <laughs> Flashy performer on stage. Gene uh, loves cheering teenagers. It's incredible. That is because we didn't have the, the the internet, the iPhones. You know, you you would read those album covers. And listen to those records and envision, okay, he's this tall. He's, you know. In, right, right. You picture him being your friend. That's so cool, man. Very cool. Now, the, what else you got over there, Phantom? Uh, we've got an original. This one is from the 50s. You can see a price tag where I found it. But this is a price tag, which you must all know. The after school session, Chuck Berry, school day, oh, ring so goes cool. the bell. Too much monkey business, no money down, downbound train, Havana Moon, brown eyed handsome man. This is all the. That's so stuff. cool. Oh, I think man. the Rolling Stones had this album. Yeah, th that cover is classic. Pull it back a little bit from the screen, right? There. Yeah, right there. Look at that. Cl 
classic, man. After school session with Chuck Berry. And then there's one um, that you would like, Steph. We would go to see our old pal um, George Harrison sometimes, mm -hmm. and uh, he had a he had a stack of records by the door when he was leaving. <laughs> when we were leaving, and says, "I'll just take one of these." This was his new album at the time. This was 19. 87. Wow. And produced by Jeff Lynn and George Harrison. On Going to Harrison's house. Huh? How was the hang with that? He's a big rockabilly guy, huh? Yeah. We went to Friar Park. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I got that from him from a, from a hotel that he was staying in. That might have been when he was in L.A. Mm. And he gave me a copy of his um, album. We had been to his house with the, the mansion, the famous one. Friar Park, quite a hang, but I think this was might have been in L.A. and like he would call once in a while. Hello, is this Slim Jim from the Stray Cats? Yes, yes. I think it's someone got the wrong number. <laughs> and he would say, "Oh, this is George Harrison from the Beatles. How you doing, kid? Well, <laughs> great. You know." He said, well, "Well, what are you doing?" I would say, "Nothing now." <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to come to the hotel, have lunch? Yeah. I'd be there in 10 minutes. He usually stayed at the Bel Air Hotel. And we would go and have lunch and drive around sometimes and other times just sit and watch TV for a couple hours. And then he would have people and you knew it was time to leave kind of thing or we just stayed and kept watching the TV. He would have some friends over, people I didn't know. Mm -hmm. It was like a race car driver guy <laughs> whatever was there. And he had a box of these by the door. So it must have been 1987 when he called me one time and went to the hotel. He said, take one of the new albums. It got my mind set on he was already on the radio a, a bit, you know, and all that. But I guess it was like the, the album had, had arrived. Yeah, that's pretty so, cool. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great story, Jim. Now, Jim, the album of the day, the record of the day right here, Jim. Yeah. Pop Pickers. That's right. This one right here, Rant and Rave. Yep. Sexy and 17. This album... Look at that. There it is. I right found there. mine. You got yours. And you know what, funny, Jim? I got mine right here. All right. Right there. What a great record. You know what's funny about this record? So was this, and correct me, out, you're, you're the guy that's been on the record yourself. So let's start. Uh, sexy, this album here, was this your third album? This would have been the your third studio album was this? Am I correct? Yeah, third studio album, but technically the fourth album because we had done two records in England because our contract is based in England, so we didn't we weren't released in America like an import strange kind of thing, and so the first release in America was a compilation of the first two British albums with a couple new songs on it, mm. one new song. So this, in a funny way, was our, our fourth release, but our second American lease, but release, but really the first release that was recorded for just the, the, for the American label. You know? First Inter one for EMI. Interesting. And, and, and on, now the hit, of course, it was the hit on here, sexy, She's Sexy in 17, but you didn't give it away on the record. It's on the second side. Right? Uh, uh, am I wrong? Yeah. It's it's side, a, I noticed that. Side, one, uh, side two, track one. Yeah. You see, this record, what's very, very special about this stuff is that we got a guy named Big Daddy Roth. Yeah. Sure your fans know who he is. Rat Fink. He invented that hot rod, mm -hmm. decal, kind of invented it. Artwork. And that's his little logo. You can see right there. Am I holding it close enough? R.F. Yes. Let me see right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, RF, That's yes, Rat of Fink. course. Rat That's Fink. Ed Roth. And he worked very hard with us, very closely with us on all the graphics. See this? Yeah. This is every song that's on the album. He made a little drawing for it. Wow. wow. Big Daddy Roth. That one is Lee. Uh, Lee, and then that's Ed Roth. But his major thing was Rat Fink, and that was the famous one. That's underneath Lee on the back of the car. I was just showing you the inside artwork. 
That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how many people's records he did, but there's a good... Um, then on the other side, but he did artwork for, for the inner sleeves. There's the one side that's got all Ed, Ed Roth's drawings for the... Uh, uh, actually, the back on this, can I tell you, was done by Christian Roth. That's Ed's son who d took over for him and did a lot of the drawings, but the logos and everything were, 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 of course, Ed himself. And then on the back side, there was just a bunch of snapshots. There was one uh, of us in the studio. Yeah. Dave Edmonds. I'm trying to think which one. I'm the wrong way. There you go. Can you get it now? That's with Dave Edmonds and the, and the Straight Cats guys in the studio. Uh-huh, yeah. Record. There's Brian when he was young on the, you know, his first guitar kind of thing. That's Lee... In his house when he was That's, little. With the roll of a Beethoven. That is killer. I mean, one of my cowboy suits. and uh... Very cool. Now, the picture with you with Dave Edmonds at the bottom, you have kind of a Ringo Starr early Rory Storm and the Hurricanes type beard that Ringo had, if you notice in that picture. Is that me? Yeah. I, um, I, I, I did a thing that I'm not going to uh, shave until we finish the album kind of thing. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, I was head of the curve with that whole beard thing. So anytime I say, oh, these kids with these stupid beards, I get busted. So I, I got to keep my mouth shut again. Now, I, I like on the upper, it says Stonewall Phantom. On the upper, you have a little <laughs> the, <laughs> the Paul yeah. Revere vibe. And my horse is red, too. There's a picture of you guys rocking at the U.S. Fest in 1983. Wow. Yep. The Us, the US, US Fest. Fest. The yeah. Us Fest. Wow, Us Festival. the Us Fest. Um, how was that? Us Festival is one of the mo uh, the more um, memorable things. I, I I do remember everything that happened. The Clash were played played that day, and we we all had to take helicopters. Or so it was over like an ocean of people, and we really arrived. Our our record was in the charts, and um, that was our moment. We went on stage during the daytime and during the set the sun went down and then the big giant lights came on so it was one of those days where everything was set up for it and there was like three hundred thousand people there was something singing rock this town it was on the radio mtv was in full blast it mm -hmm. was like that was our day yeah and, uh, it all lined up that day it did all lined up that day Wow, so this record now, when you guys did this, did you have the songs written in, or you wrote, you wrote it in the studio, or you had? Uh, on Rant and Rave, that was one of the times, because the first, the record before this, Built for Speed, that was a compilation of the other two albums. So this was, in a way, in, in a lot of ways, really the first record for EMI, the first full album mm -hmm. for them, because we had been on Arista, but it was uh, excluding the U.S. That's how the record contract was structured. It was so funny. So when we came to the States, Arista Records released us from the contract. Don't know why. They could have signed it and it had been a hit all over the world. And they released the compilation with Built for Speed. So, this, so the next, the follow-up was Rant and Rave. This one that you chose was really the first proper record for emi and the first proper record for the state so we had a little bit of time we had some success uh so and brian was really really on a roll brian wrote one two three four five six seven eight of these songs like and brought them into the studio it was quite quite um quite impressive he had sexy and 17 that i think is a perfect pop song he's really got he's got a bridge in it he's got a solo he's got a really nice and then we had a big hit with i won't stand in your way Mm -hmm. That was a doo -op ballad that we had proper doo -op backing group called 14 Carat Soul from East Orange, New Jersey, oh, wow. who we saw at the bottom line <laughs> and we loved them and we took them on the road with us and they were the opening act and they would also sing with us every night on that song. It was funny how we did this record. We still recorded it in London. We recorded it at a place called Maison Rouge that's not there anymore, but it was a studio right there in Chelsea. Fulham, Chelsea area, owned by Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. Oh, wow. It was his studio. It was a great, great little studio. 
And then we went back to New York to mix at uh, Record Plant on 45th Street. So we did a month in London and then say a month in New York at Record Plant for the mixing. So back in the high rolling days when you like took time and went to different places, not this has to be done by tomorrow, do yeah. it in Pacoima, and uh, that's that, you know, it was. Did you know, Jim, did you know that you had a hit there when you heard Sexy and 17 right out the gate? Like, oh man, this is the one. I think we knew that it was going to line up because it was, it seemed like it was the priority for the record company. Whereas when we put out Rant and Ray, uh, put out Built for Speed, it was almost like a quirk. It was a combination of two albums. MTV had just started. Nobody knew who we were here. And it was a surprise hit. Like it was double platinum. It was a, it was a surprise hit. So the next record we do... I'm sure the company had their meetings and all that, and this was was the priority. It got this, the preferred release, and the whole company was behind it. And I think it sold a million and a half, almost you know two million. And wow. back then, that was a failure because the previous one had sold a million. This one only sold a million, uh, had sold two million. This one only sells a million and a half. It's perceived as some type of uh, letdown, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when the whole world was going through strange change so like i i think we toured this record for two years and then in eight, 85 is when we we all made solo albums for emi which was another funny thing and then we went back and made blast off i think then there were four years between albums it's a funny thing that is a funny who would you do you remember you recall who, this album who you were on tour with uh well this album was produced by dave edmonds mm -hmm. and i think dave edmonds band opened up a bunch of the shows because we toured this record for almost two years. Some of the opening acts I remember that were on it were, do you remember the bus boys? Of course. Yeah. The bus boys were one of the opening acts. Mm -hmm. um, in excess was one of the opening acts. Wow. Uh, in excess, very, huh? Yeah, they did. See, some bands would do maybe two weeks of the tour kind of thing or a week of the tour. The bus boys did most of it in excess, did some West coast, dates and then i stayed and became very friendly with um michael and um uh the bus boys guys i'm so friendly with them there was a few special guests that came on when they were trying to get rockabilly was almost going in the states a few times there was a band called roman holiday they had one hit song and they came over and uh were part of the opening act but you would do a lot of festivals then because like i said we toured this album for two years so there yeah. was a uh, but the main ones were the Bus Boys and In Excess, from what I remember. Very cool. Very cool. So early In Excess before it became. Yeah, it would have been. I don't think it was their first American tour. I think maybe their second. They weren't headliners yet. And then just a couple of years after that, when we decided to make solo albums, Lee Rocker and myself made an album with Earl Slick. And we were the opening act for In Excess tour. So <laughs> <laughs> how quickly things change in rock and roll. How how quickly how quickly, I remember when the Stones were on the road and you guys opened up for the Stones. Mm. That was another great tour, huh? Yeah, that was in eighty one. That was before we had a release in America because how our original record contract was structured. It was for in the lingo of the day, it's called X U S, and it's just like a band who signed in England. They would mainly concentrate on England or Europe or that kind of thing, right? They didn't know that we were going to be like an international act so much. But yeah. we went to England even though we were Americans and signed the contract there. So Arista Records, who released the first two, could have released the compilation album themselves. But for whatever, whatever reason, they chose not to. EMI picked up the option for it because nobody wanted it. Mm -hmm made the compilation of the first two British records into uh, into Built for Speed. We put a couple new songs on it to make it new, and that was it. And then a year and a half, maybe two years later, we went and did this one. Fantastic album cover, Jim. Yeah, and it was shot in uh, – we had the same photographer, a guy named Gavin Cochran, who was a very uh, – almost like a graphic uh, photographer. He shot a lot of advertisements, but he also did a lot of album covers. He did the second Pretenders album. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he did a lot of people. Some that he became friendly with through through us because he was a commercial guy that we just loved. The Stray Cats used we I can't even tell you how many photo shoots we used to do all by quite well known people. And we just had a thing with Gavin Cochran that worked, and he did all our album covers that we ever did. And this one we went to the old neighborhood. This was in Massapequa. Um, at a, a friend's auto body shop I know was for built for speed. This was a location somewhere in Massapequa and the car that we're using is Brian's car. Oh, wow. Brian's car. Wow. Brian's 32 Deuce Coupe. Wow. And that's a 32, huh? Wow. And then the back album sleeve where it's so big was shot here in LA by Robert Matthew. I don't, I don't know. You think I, I think you knew Bob Matthew, Steph. He was a guy around town, a photographer. Mm -hmm. He was a guy who worked for Cream Magazine. Yeah. And he was our good friend. And we were so on the fence because we loved both photos. <laughs> but ultimately, the one that Gavin, who had done all of our record sleeves, got the A cover. And Robert is really like a, like a cover B. Yeah. And this was done in um, L.A. Great, great, man. That's a great, great cover. That's mm. funny when you say you're on the fence because <laughs> you go, okay, what do we do? But yeah. then the, the, the car wins. <laughs> Come on, the car wins. The I car just, wins. Yeah, the car, car we flown, had, had flown Gavin from London, you know, so. I mean, you, you got a lot of coverage in this. Look at this. The pictures over here, if you're looking. On the inside sleeve. In the yeah. inside sleeve. That, that caused a riff when it it because we get that much artwork out of anyone these days, like a label. I don't know how, uh, you know, into they would, into it they would be, right? To spend yeah. that much bread and to get all that graphic together, it's it's a lot of. I mean the the whole of stuff. The whole thing. Look at it: singing and twanging electric folk and Hawaiian guitars. Lee Rocker slapping that doghouse bass. Slim Jim Phantom howling and screaming. Hidden, not missing. <laughs> Mel Collins, saxophones. Yep. Swell Mel. He was um, he was a real musician guy around London. He played with hundred bands. He he was the uh, I think that's him playing the sax solo on Domino by Van Morrison. He was with King Crimson. Wow. He was kind of the session guy for London. He played on a million things, and he was a guy that we brought in to play on the record, because Brian had a song called Look at That Cadillac that we had uh, a horn section on it. And Mel played all the different horns, just overdubbed himself with the different horns. And he became part of the gang very quickly, and he came and toured with us for years. Wow, that's pretty Twelve cool. Well, Mel Collins. That's great. What were you listening to back then on the making of this record? Do you recall what you were listening to back then? Um, I do know that we would have gotten into a lot of jump blues, a lot of stuff like, uh, let me show you. I know that we would have been into stuff like this. <laughs> show you right here. Can you see that? Big yeah. Joe Turner. Yeah. Because it's Rock and Billy, that album, but it's definitely got a jump blues, like a 40s kind of blues style on there that we love. So this was Joe Turner. Big Joe Turner, the daddy of the blues. And I like to set a tempo sort of like this for him to bring him on so I can give him to you. Hey, Joe. Hey, Big Joe Turner. And uh, Shake, Rattle, and Roll was his big one, of course. Um, a lot of stuff, a lot of the stuff that Bill Haley would have been listening to, and those early rockabilly guys. And this one is by uh, that's Ray Brown. So you got me right by my vinyl, right by the section that these are the ones that we would have been listening to. Joe Turner, that's great. Roy Brown, and I got to tell you that no matter what we did, the Stray Cats, this one was never far away. The second Gene Vincent album, which is really the, you know, 
the go-to disc for for us always was yeah. you know that was the one and there would there would have been always very close by where, That's that great. Been our main. Yeah. That's our cool. Main, really, that Eddie Cochran and that Gene Vincent, they would have been the real, the main ones. And we would have never gone too many days in a row that you didn't listen to that. <laughs> Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Eddie Cochran. Yeah. So this with the Gene Vincent mixed with the Jump Blues, ones that we had gotten turned on to, like Joe Turner. Mm-hmm like Roy Brown, uh, that really would have been what what we were listening to. I certainly know Brian when he was writing it, and that's what we were going for. Like, let's mix the rockabilly more with uh, with with that hard swinging jump blues. That's what came out of that one. It's a great one, Steph. I know you'll like that one. Slim Jim, where could everybody find you in Sirius? Tell them about your show. Uh, Sirius XM every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We do the Rockabilly Rave Up with me, your Rockabilly buddy, Slim Jim Phantom, right here in Little Stevens Underground Garage, Sirius XM, Channel 21. Channel 21. Okay, everybody, we love you. Remember, God bless you all, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Steph. All right, here we go. Talking wax, pow. Now, before we go, everybody, you're going to click over there, over there, over there, and over there, over here. Share, share, follow Talking Wax, and follow Mr. Slim Jim Phantom on Sirius Radio. Okay? We love you, everybody. All righty. Bye-bye.